On this episode of On Top of PR, we are joined by Laura Reese. Laura and I are talking about the fall of advertising and the rise of PR, as well as brand positioning and many other topics you might recognize her for writing and speaking and consulting on. Uh, her and her father, Al Reese, have several books that are considered some of the most thought-provoking and uh, most important writings uh, of our time when it comes to marketing, advertising, and public relations. This is going to be a great episode. I'm glad you're here. You're really going to enjoy it. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd, and I'm joined today with Laura Reese. Laura, welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Thanks so much. Well, we're glad to have you. Um, I was just thinking about uh, you guys have a great book called The Fall of Advertising, The Rise of PR. This That's one? the one. Yep, <laughs> there it is. <laughs> I'm glad you brought props. Um, and uh, so the book came out, as I recall, in 2002. And yeah. I started my agency in 2003. Um, and I remember the book just kind of resonating with me as if I were going to write a book, this is exactly what I would want communicated. And you all did the heavy work for me. So thank you. And I returned the favor by buying several copies of the book and sharing it with our clients and our prospects. Because uh, that really is, you know, kind of my philosophy of, of why PR is the best place to put your dollars into. And I'd love to just talk about that with you on this episode, as well as uh, some of your other books and, and, and content that you guys are actively putting out there. Well, great. It is so, uh, it's so, such a pleasure to be here. And believe me, after that book, we made a lot of fast friends in PR. <laughs> and it was a really exciting time. And those friendships continue. And we continue to talk about PR. Which, and your story, you know, isn't that unusual. Like I said, a lot of PR professionals really gravitated to the book and pushed it to their friends and their clients and their prospects. And one of the great things was we weren't PR people, right? right. And I came from the advertising background. So it was the point of an advertising centric PR people writing this book, um, you know, saying that the fall of advertising and the rise of PR. And it, it wasn't that we were anti-advertising. That's kind of a misnomer because the mm -hmm. title had to be shocking, right? right? But it was the time and place that to build brands, you really need the credibility and credentials that mm -hmm. PR brings you. And that's why for your agency, the book brought you those credentials. It wasn't you saying PR was great. Of course, a right. PR guy would say it, <laughs> was great. but it was right. advertising and brand building people and marketing consultants saying that you need advertising, you need the power of word of mouth, of third party endorsement to build your brand. And uh, yeah, we're so excited about um, the change that has happened and the brands that have really embraced this and the agencies like yours that have risen because of it, because more companies are using PR for really what its intention was um, and what it works best at in terms of getting ideas into the mind of the consumer and starting with a PR focus, not having it be an afterthought, which it used to be, unfortunately. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, first of all, the book title you mentioned earlier reminding me of my friend uh, Tim Ferriss, who wrote The 4-Hour Workweek. <laughs> And he says very clearly, look, it's, it's kind of gimmicky, four-hour work week is probably not <laughs> realistic, but it's what the publisher said, this will sell more books, so this is what we're going to go with. And then, you know, good for him, I guess it's become a theme of four-hour body and four-hour this and four-hour mm -hmm. that. So, yeah, but I mean, yeah, you need a sexy title to be able to sell books and, and push them off the shelves. And, uh, and I think, yeah, the PR profession uh, visibility and credibility was raised through your writing and through, you know, uh, your organization's influence as, you know, writing some outstanding marketing books that are out there for sure. Well, it really was important to, to, to raise the profession in terms of making it more strategic. Mm -hmm. um, and the idea being that, you know, you to build you with PR, things have to be different. You have to have news value. See, mm -hmm. advertising was always focused on things like line extensions because that worked well with advertising was brands people knew and it was easy to get them on the shelf. And then you had ads that people maybe recognize, but it was a terribly detrimental for brands. Of course, line extension weakens brands over time. You're watering down what your brand stands for. I mean, really, Corona sells. So you got to be kidding me. That's the most <laughs> ridiculous idea. Yet yeah. that's the kind of idea um, that, that that advertising promotes to extend the brand, put your brand on as many things as possible, and we'll advertise all of them, right, with yeah. a big Super Bowl ad. Uh, but that undermines brands in the long term. Instead, when you're thinking in terms of PR, it's how do I get people to talk Talk about this. How is this going to be new and different? How are we going to have news value about 
about it. And the best thing um, for news value are new brands, most specifically new categories, because uh, really people don't care about brands. They care about categories. And that's what the media covers. That's what drive wor drives word of mouth. And specifically, when you can narrow the focus, you take something like Zoom, which everyone is you know on now or TikTok. These were new categories with new brands that have exploded when it comes to PR, because there's definitely something to talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I think every day somebody at my agency is guiding a client on the whole concept of, you know, lead with PR and then advertise once you've exhausted all the PR opportunities. <laughs> and and so it's so true. And, and, and your book did an excellent job of pointing that out, how if you go and pitch a story to an editor or a writer and there's already been advertisements appearing either in their news outlets or somebody else's yeah. news outlet, they're like, I already know about this. I know my audience already does. Why in the world would we take a step backwards and start writing about it as if it's new? You know, And so the key word is that you know, news has to be new. It can't be, we ran an ad campaign last week. Now we want you to write, you know, we want you to do a story about it. And that used to, that used to be how it went, right it was done, yeah. and, and sometimes it still is. And then really nothing kills the PR potential as much as an advertising campaign, right? As you say, for the, from experience, you go to an editor, or they they don't want. I mean, yeah, the ads are all over the buses, all over the city. We're not going to write about it. It's not new and different. Everyone's seen it. Um, and so you know, not intentionally not doing advertising when you're launching a brand is actually incredibly important. And many of the top brands spent decades on things like Starbucks. I mean, they had enormous buzz, but it wasn't created through advertising. Now, listen, many uh, young brands don't have money up front. It's actually to their advantage. Uh, in the dot-com bubble, you know, many brands threw everything into advertising and it was a disaster because mm -hmm. they needed the credibility that PR bring, brings. And that's what's so exciting about it. Yeah, as I'm thinking about in your book, you're reminding me uh, that, that I think the examples were, I think uh, Starbucks and Target and a couple other brands didn't advertise at all, or at least for much of their early years, they didn't even touch it. And uh, I'm, I happen to be a very proud uh, Tesla owner, loyal Tesla owner, and I'm in some Tesla Facebook groups. And people are always like, I don't understand. Why doesn't Tesla advertise? They should be advertising. And I'm just face palming, you know, thinking to myself, you know, the beauty is they don't have to advertise, nor should they. And I think I've even heard Elon say, you know, we're probably never going to advertise. And you don't have to. I mean, he gets so much attention already. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. And yeah. Well, yeah, that is such a great example. And Tesla, yeah. Red Bull. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so many brands that, you know, and again, these are all as well in new categories, right? right. Tesla is the only brand that, ex, you know, focused on the electric car only. And of mm -hmm. course, they, you know, they dominate the market. Red Bull, you know, in, invented the energy drink um, and they dominate the market. And so, again, what's really interesting in all the cases, though, and it's so important as a part of PR, is having a celebrity CEO, <laughs> um, <laughs> somebody who can be the spokesperson. Because, listen, you can't interview a car. You've got, I mean, you can put a car in an ad. You don't need a, a CEO. CEO or anybody. Uh, but when it comes to PR, having a person who is going to devote a lot of time and be really good at being a spokesperson and being on TV is vital these days. You know, whether you're NVIDIA, whether you're Tesla, whether whatever company it is, having a CEO who can be that spokesperson um, is so, so important. I mean, of course, you know, with big news today with, you know, Apple doing and Tim Cook, you know, what he what's he going to say? Um, right. Everybody wants to know because they're following the company. Company and, and they're listening to that CEO because they're delivering the news about the company. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, rock star CEOs are within the age of social media. People are connecting with CEOs. And, yeah, and they don't even have to be like super like rock starry. Right? <laughs> but yeah. they are, you know, Bill Gates is still a nerd <laughs> and yeah. many of them. Um, but, you know, they do have to be speak to their brand and speak up for their brand uh, and be that person who really is just the, the total evangelist for their brand. Mm -hmm. And people love to hear from them and the media loves to talk to them. And that's, you know, what we see though, those companies. And that's, that's the predicament too, over time when the founder leaves, how do you get that next person? You know, Tim Cook has become a very good spokesperson, but right. it wasn't easy making the transition <laughs> from Steve Jobs, yeah, big who shoes. was a master at it, right. to go to Tim Cook. It's really hard. Yeah. And one other point to, to make too is, you know, there does 
often come a time and place for advertising. And, and it's what you, you briefly alluded to earlier. It's the maintenance of the brand. So you, right. you don't use advertising to tell somebody new, to introduce somebody or to change their mind. One of the reasons brands take so long um, and why you know PR is so essential is because it takes time to get in the mind, uh, to can change someone's mind, to think that a, a Red Bull tastes good or they want to drink it. That <laughs> wasn't an easy sell or, or to pay $4 for a Starbucks. Right. That wasn't an easy sell either. But over time, the PR, the buzz drove those those brands and those categories mm -hmm. into the mind. Now, over time, you know, brands lose their buzz. I mean, Red Bull isn't new anymore. There's a mm -hmm. Starbucks on every corner. And that's when you want to use advertising to defend your position. Um, you're, you're, it's not an aggressive move. It's a defensive to, to keep competitors at bay, right. if you will, yeah. and to remind people what it is you stand for. Yeah, that's good. That's good. The other thing I think, uh, at least in my mind, falls under the umbrella of PR is is social media. And going back to the example of uh, Elon Musk and Tesla, I was given my friend Dwight a ride home uh, from a business meeting we were both at. Um, and uh, he, he rode in my Tesla, was asking me all kinds of questions. Mm -hmm. And and I told him, I said, he said, what's some of the coolest things about having a Tesla? And I said, well, the primary reason was autopilot. But the other cool thing about having a Tesla is the overnight updates that you can get. I said, but, but what's really cool is when you see somebody on Twitter engage with the CEO of the company <laughs> to throw out a suggestion of an over the air update for the car. And he replies back and goes, that's a great idea. We'll, we'll, we'll go to work on that right away and have it live in a week or two. And literally there have been things that have happened in our car that have made the user experience better from an over the air update, overnight mm -hmm. update in the car software wise that came from a user generated comment or suggestion through Twitter. And I think that's the best customer feedback, right? Because there's no more focus groups needed for Tesla because mm -hmm. on Twitter, they're getting feedback all the time because they know customers, users know that they'll actually take that feedback and do something with it to improve the user experience. Imagine that bomb getting blown into the whole mix of marketing and customer experiences, right? The ability to use social media to interface directly with a CEO that normally, what would you do? You'd write a letter and maybe they'll see it, right? Maybe is right. Um, but it does come down to the brand standing for something that those c consumers and customers feeling passionate about. I mean, you feel so passionate and you know a lot about your Tesla because Tesla stands for something. They're, they're, they're pioneer in electric vehicles. I mean, they're the first brand in the mind. They dominate the mind. I mean, how is, you know, General Motors going to have a Twitter account? I mean, they've got so many brands and their right. name on so many products um, from expensive to cheap to trucks to sports cars. I mean, what What's the point of view? Um, you know, what are they going to engage with and who are they going to engage, uh, you know, with and, and how, what's the position there? What's the discussion yeah. about? Um, is it for small cars or is it for big gas guzzlers? Uh, is it for Hummers or is it for the vault? Yeah. Um, there, it's very hard to, to take a, have a position, to have a discussion um, when you don't really have a focus. And that's mm -hmm. where I think social media can be um, for brands that do have a position, that, that do have a strong following right. um, and that are pioneering and, and dominating in categories, that's where you can really have that kind of discussion. When you have a little bit of lots of businesses, what are you going to talk about? That's the yeah. problem. You make a great point because going back to GM and other automakers, right? They're kind of dabbling in the electric space, right? And then they wonder why they're not selling, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're going to take the risk of buying an electric car, I think you should buy one from somebody who's all in, absolutely <laughs> focused is what they do every day as opposed to, oh yeah, we've got, in addition to like you said, a dozen lines of products, we also have this one thing over here that we're really starting to focus on, right? Okay. Well, you know, I don't think they'll ever be successful in that space until they really just start walking away from what their, uh, the rest of their business is doing. And the risk is so high for them to do that. I don't see that happening. What do you think, Laura? Well, absolutely. That I mean, that's a, that's a great, really good way of phrasing it. All in. Yeah. <laughs> and big companies don't ever want to be all in, right? <laughs> right? All they talk about is diversification. They want to yeah. be a little bit of everywhere to stay yeah. safe. Well, yeah. staying safe isn't how you get in the mind of the consumer. Uh, it go. is not how you engage with them. Um, yeah. Being all in is the way to go. Now, you can be a big company um, like Procter & Gamble and own multiple brands. Um, 
um, or even Apple is is very good. It, they don't have one name on everything. It is the iPhone, the iPad, and the Macintosh, and those are each individual brands uh, under the umbrella, of course, of the Apple uh, computer company. But those individual brands on individual categories are really an important part of that of that success story that that is Apple. And again, with you know the car companies, it is such a tragedy because there was you know they just didn't want to take the leap. They have line extended all of their models into you know the regular Camry and we've got the electric Camry. I mean, very few have really gone all in um, because you know right now the market is small. Of course, potentially it's you know likely to dominate, um, but they, they don't see the long term benefits of investing in a totally new brand now, even though that's the best strategy. Absolutely. Uh, Laura, we're going to take a quick break and be right back on the other side. So hang with us. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social and web strategies for national companies. And now back to the show. All right, we're back and we're with Laura Reese. Uh, Laura, we're so glad you're here. I wanted to talk to you about something else in your book, and that is a great story that I love to tell. It's like a good cocktail or trivial conversation point. But uh, um, uh, in the book, you write about how uh, Budweiser sales were slipping. And so the answer, to, and meanwhile, Bud, Bud Light sales are increasing. Okay. And, and and the wisdom of the marketing department or advertising department, they said, well, we, that means we have to grow our advertising spend for Budweiser. And if we increase the advertising, that'll increase sales. Well, they increased the advertising, but sales didn't do very much as I recall, right? And it was, it was the shift, it was the inability to shift the mindset that maybe the customer wants the light beer, <laughs> right? And so while they had this product, um, you know, that they had for years and it suddenly started seeing a decrease in consumption. They're like, I'll just throw more money at it instead of listening to what the customers are saying and what the sales are showing. Yeah, no, it was, it was such a tragedy and it's such a great example because you really did see a, a major shift. And this is often what you see when you see categories divide. I mean, beer used to be beer, right? And mm -hmm. Budweiser was the king of beer. Um, but then along came something called light beer. <laughs> and, you know, Miller was the first and they called, they gave it a terrible name. They gave it the generic L-I-T-E, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? But it, it gained traction. Why? Because not really the branding so much as the category was a powerful idea. Right. right. It was, it tastes great, but it was less filling and, yep. and people like to consume a lot when they're at, at football games and with their friends and everything else. So light beer, you know, did have a lot of advantages. Now it wasn't a quick to take off in terms it didn't dominate the market. It took, you know, over decades um, to do that, but um, there was a future potential, much like we talked about in the previous segment about electric cars, right? They don't dominate the market today, but there's no doubt that's going to be the future. And that was the case with like beer, but what do you do if you're Budweiser or, or Miller or Coors? <laughs> and what did the big three do? Did they think and say, hey, this is going to be such a big category. Uh, do we launch a new brand for this new category? Or do we take this brand, uh, Budweiser or Coors or Miller, that people know, that people love, and do we line extend it? Well, you know, we've got the advertising. We love our advertising. And so they just wanted everyone they thought loved the brand. And so they wanted to offer them a wide variety, you know, but in any flavor, right? Um, unfortunately, you know, short term that will have in actually in some cases a boost in sales as people will try it. They've, they've tried Bud Light Seltzer and they'll try lots of stuff. <laughs> but long term, what is a Budweiser? Is it really the king of beers? Do people really think it's the most powerful brand? Not so. It's a watered down version today. It doesn't stand for anything really because they've put their name on everything. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's funny. One of the great stories is, you know, Al in the 70s actually went out to Colorado and met with the, the people at Coors. Now, Coors was, was a legendary brand. I mean, this had enormous PR potential. It was only in the West. I mean, presidents would fly it to the White House. It was really a coveted, cool, hip 
brand that only, you know, that the really, really in people knew about and drank and everything else. It had a great mystique. It was water from the Rocky Mountains, a great PR story. Mm -hmm. um, and again, you know, they had a great potential out, talk to them and, and said, you know, forget the regular beer. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't you make Coors a light beer only? It actually was a bit lighter because it was the high altitude in, in Denver. They did make it lighter on purpose. So it could have been, it was already a light beer. Uh, why not focus it and not have the line extension name was a very, is a troubling thing. It's like diet for Coke or light for a beer. Um, you know, everyone sees it as not the real thing. Um, and Coors could have been, you know, stood for light beer in that category and, and continue that brand mistake instead of um, what they eventually did was, you know, go with the line extension route um, and, you know, kind of a tragedy, a, a tragedy in the sense that actually the whole category has been damaged because there wasn't any real brand that stood for light beer. Uh, they all were line extensions. Uh, and long term, what did people do? They, they've gone to, to craft beer and then they've gone to seltzer now and they've gone to different brands that like Sam Adams and White Claw, for example. Now is a good time to be in the beer or alcohol business anyway, just given COVID and everything else. <laughs> but but you're right. The more craft and, and unique it is, the, the more people seem to be uh, drawn into it. So and uh, for sure. So, Laura, uh, obviously, you know, we're living in the times of COVID and the pandemic. Um, I'm sure that's impacted uh, your business because I know you speak quite a bit and, and travel quite a bit. Um, what's uh, what's new for you and what have you been up to lately? Yeah, sure. We, um, you know, our business is split between writing books and consulting with with companies on marketing and positioning strategy, and and then giving speeches on these topics around the world. Actually, been to over sixty countries. Uh, it's really exciting to see how the principles actually work uh, for companies around the world. Um, Obviously, with COVID, I haven't traveled. I had a big world tour back in February, right before this hit, um, and have been hunkered down pretty much ever since. Uh, luckily, with the technology, I've been able to do interviews like this, uh, do some virtual speaking that way, and, and meeting with clients this way. Mm -hmm. uh, technology has really been um, you know, a great asset uh, for us. But I do look forward to 2021 and, and getting, back, getting back in the road in front of people as well. I think there's a, a great live experience of being at at a big Absolutely. event with a lot yeah. of people. Um, what's interesting is in, from the branding aspect, it's 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 always two directions. It's the mushy middle that is the problem. Um, you know, big, exciting events that are really about entertainment and meeting people, I think will flourish, uh, you know, when we get over this pandemic. But so will these kind of intimate things, using technology to easily connect, um, you know, from your, from your office to, to people instantly around the world with video, which obviously I'm a big proponent of visuals. And and I think that is a, is a great way of, of getting together, getting the emotion that only video and images can portray. Yeah, I totally agree. I think uh, that it will be, people w are naturally desired to come together, uh, especially mm -hmm. extroverts like yourself, right? And <laughs> and so they find fuel and energy in those environments. And, and I know it'll come back. It might be different and it might take a while, but eventually I think just like everything else, you know, we just, uh, got past, you know, memorializing 9-11 and the world was different after 9-11 for a while, but then things started loosening up a little bit and a little bit more return to normal. We'll see the same thing here as well. So, uh, yeah, and, and, and you really will see, uh, again, what I said, or kind of the extremes of the situation where, uh, you know, it's, it, you have big groups and you have very small kind of technology things. I mean, much like with beer, right? Yeah. You've got Sam Adams, a very, very heavy kind of full of flavor uh, product, and then you have seltzer, which has basically no flavor. So you don't like seltzer, so I'm not getting you any seltzer for your <laughs> Actually, for I, love, I love seltzer. I, 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 I'm drinking some right now, but it's, it's yeah. th th there's no Look, stuff well, not, uh, <laughs> not, uh, not Budweiser or not uh, Corona. No, seltzer, no, right? no, 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 <laughs> Yeah, excellent. Uh, and so tell me, are you working on a new book or uh, what's happening there? Yeah, well, we've been, um, uh, we actually released it first in, in China, if you believe you can believe that. We have a very, uh, very successful office out of Shanghai with our partner, Simon, over there. And so we're talking about positioning in the 21st century, how the principles of positioning, um, many of them have remained the same, but some of them have changed and new ones have come about, particularly in the, the idea of visual hammer, which you see behind me, of the importance of having a visual to drive your idea to own that position in the mind being incredible. Important. 
important, as well as the idea of category, uh, like we talked about today. Um, in, in building brands, it is the category uh, that really is the, is the big idea and what people really care about and how you can define your own new category, build your brand, and of course, use PR to get it in the, eye, in the mind. That's music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> so of all the books you've done, what, which one is your, what are your uh, top two? Oh, goodness. It's like trying to choose your children, isn't it? I know, right? And you're on the spot to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, because we're here and uh, actually because it came out the same year my first child was born, uh, The Fall of Advertising and the Rise of PR is really um, a very a very special book because it, it really um, it, it changed a lot of minds in how people perceived um, PR and mm -hmm. how they, they could better understand when advertising was appropriate, but, but really the importance of PR and, and word of mouth. And then, of course, it took off as well with the internet of the ability to have those conversations right. and then that book behind me visual hammers also a, a personal favorite um you know talking about the powers of, of of visuals to drive the emotional powers that visuals provide to drive ideas in the mind so you talk about you know corona beer for example and you have that lime in the top of the bottle which was mm -hmm. a very powerful visual hammer to drive the idea that it was the authentic mexican beer right. um and so that was you know of course remember Remembering a time where that's the only thing that Corona came to mind was that delicious beer from Mexico. Um, but hopefully everyone is staying safe and uh, we all we all get through this and uh, go on to great things in the coming months. Yeah, absolutely. And Laura, if, if our audience wants to connect with you, what are some of the best ways for them to reach you? Oh, absolutely. Well, it's super simple. You just go to our website and that is Reese, R-I-E-S dot com. And you can find all of our information and uh, a list of our books and all of our social media connections and everything there uh, you could ever want to know about Reese. And that's, of course, Reese and Reese, because I am partnered with my and my co-author, of course, Al Reese, uh, the father of positioning. The legend Al Reese himself, yes, for sure. Yes, yes he's, absolutely. He's doing, yeah, he's doing terrific. Um, he and I are both here in Atlanta. And uh, yeah, it's been, I mean, what what better thing to work with your dad for over 25 years? Yeah, absolutely. And, and a great guy and an icon in the industry and just so grateful for everything that you and he are doing. And um, appreciative of you taking the time to be on this episode today. And if there's ever anything I can do for you, please let me know. Absolutely. It was my pleasure. I loved the conversation. Thanks so much. Thank you, Laura. Be well and uh, take care. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. 